Well, at some point, like I said, you're going to get to hear from Emmy, too, about her experience. And she's already done some writing on, on her experience. But it was funny. Um, this is the second time in a row that we've used the same guide for our trip to Israel, Saeed. Um, he has such wonderful knowledge of just the culture and the customs, but also the archaeology that is taking place all over in the Holy Land. And Emmy had such a good time. We were joking. I was joking with Saeed. And I said, well, you know, if my wife wants to come back in 2019, maybe we'll bring our three boys and they can stay at your house. <laughs> Saeed has children that are, are close to our boys' age. And Saeed looked at me and he said, I think my wife would kill herself. <laughs> he has a real dry sense of humor, but we, we just, we appreciated that about him. You know, one of the things that you initially notice when you get to the Holy Land is just how dry and rocky the terrain is. And you probably noticed that in some of the previous pictures I've shown over the last couple of years, but I think it was also evident in that short video that you, ha you had to view a moment ago. In fact, if you look around, most of everything that is built over there is, is they use quarried and dressed stone. And that's probably one of the things that hasn't changed a whole lot from the time of Jesus. You don't see a lot of wooden structures. Everything is made of stone. And really, if you think about it, that makes sense because that's something that they have a lot of. Now, one of my favorite places to visit when we've been over there, and this probably changes from day to day, but one of my favorite places to visit is the Western Wall in the Temple Mount area. The Temple of Herod the Great during the time of Jesus, it was a magnificent, magnificent building. And you can see right there, there's a model that was created by the, from the writings of a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. And it was one of the modern wonders of the ancient world. And I think it really would still be today. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And the only part that remains today is the Western Wall, just a, a, just a small portion of it, the Western Wall, or as the Jews refer to it, called the Wailing Wall. Now, to appreciate the immensity of how huge this temple was, this structure, you have to go underground and you have to explore what's called the Western Wall Tunnels, it's underground, only underground, that you can see the cornerstone or the foundation stone of the original temple. The cornerstone in biblical times was the first and most important stone laid in a foundation. It was the most important part of the structure. And I want you to just listen to our guide, Saeed, as he talks about this foundation stone from his own words. It's about a minute and 30 seconds. By, uh, by building the Western Retaining Wall, later you will see where Jason and Katie, they're standing, you will see how big is the stone. Wow. The stone is one of the biggest ever building objects that it was, it was lifted without machines uh, in history. We are talking about 500 tons plus, like uh, 500 tons, 500,000 kilograms. We're talking about 45 feet long, uh, 10, 11 feet high, and 10 feet deep. Okay? We're talking about the biggest building stone in this part of the world and maybe all over the world. The stone one stone that it weighed like three aeroplanes going 747. <laughs> Just single stone. And it was lifted up by by men. They used woods, they used pulleys, and they placed it. And what made things worse, it's not just what about this. So in case you missed that, that foundation stone is 45 feet in length, 13 feet wide, 
and it weighed in excess of 570 tons. It's absolutely huge. And they did all of this without the benefit of our modern technology, our modern machinery. To me, that's just incredible. And so when we look at our parable this morning, in some ways it takes on an added significance because our parable talks about a cornerstone. So if you take your Bibles, I want you to turn back to our text in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 19. And this is Jesus' parable. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one he also they beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. You know, often the Pharisees were confused by the parables that Jesus told, but this one is pretty clear to them. The image of the prophets being killed by Israel's leaders and that God would punish Israel's leaders was insulting enough to them. But the statement that the vineyard would be given to others, that the kingdom of God would be opened to the Gentiles, was more than the Pharisees could stand. As the text says, they wanted to arrest him immediately. There's obviously a more sinister purpose in mind, and that comes to fruition a bit later on Good Friday. We know what happens on Good Friday. The last straw for the Pharisees came as Jesus mentioned this cornerstone. It's just one short statement, one short sentence compared to the rest of the gospel reading, but it's very important. It's, it's an important link with powerful imagery concerning salvation. You know, one of the greatest difficulties that we face today as Christians is that we are biblically illiterate compared to the people of Jesus' time and compared in large part to Muslims today. Children in first century Israel had to first learn, they had to, they had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament by the time they were 10 years of age. Now just let that sink in. Memorizing the first five books of the Bible. Many Christians today can't even name the first five books of the Old Testament. Muslim children today in the Middle East and elsewhere are taught in school to memorize the Koran at a very early age. Christian children today in the United States who even mention the Bible or name Jesus in school often face suspension or other punishment, or at the very least, they're ridiculed. You know, when we hear the words of Jesus in the Gospels, we often think that Jesus has just given his listeners some new and wonderful messages. But Jesus' listeners recognized him foremost as a rabbi who really knew his Bible. It amazes me that some people will say they believe Jesus was just a great moral teacher, but they don't believe the Bible. 
while almost everything that Jesus says initially comes from the Old Testament. Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah from about 750 BC, who was also referencing Psalm 118. And if you would take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 118, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23, and you're going to recognize a familiar sentence once again. Psalm 118, 20 through 23. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous to our eyes. You see the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus meant when he used the term cornerstone in referring to himself. And you can see why the Pharisees were a little bit miffed. They knew the penalty for rejecting God's cornerstone because they also knew the scriptures. For Jesus to be declaring himself as the cornerstone that is being rejected must have had steam just shooting out of their ears. Not only was Jesus claiming to be the foundation of all human salvation, he was also saying to the Pharisees, you're not going to have any part of this. Jesus is that key element in each of our lives. The only thing that holds us together. The single most important aspect of our foundation. But do we treat him or even recognize him as that? Do we focus our lives? Do we immerse our lives on Jesus? Or do we allow other things, other cares of the world to distract us. You see, when we turn ourselves over to God, He changes our lives, He changes our outlook, and He transforms our character. As a result, our old selves are no longer a part of us. And our old sinful ways are not things that we should look back to fondly or hope to return to. If we are focused on becoming a disciple of Jesus, our old ways are distractions to us. Now the Apostle Paul recognized this. And he tells us that everything that he had gained in his life outside of God's will, things that he had lost once he became a follower of Jesus Christ, he now regards as garbage. You see, Paul was a Pharisee in very high standing. A shining young star who would very likely become a member of the Sanhedrin, Israel's ruling body of 71 top religious leaders. And along with the fame and the reverence that being a Pharisee brought, there was also this lifestyle of wealth and ease. But when Paul began to follow Jesus, realizing that Jesus was Israel's promised Messiah, his life changed. He no longer was considered a rising star. And he was forced to live in squalor, barely making enough money, repairing tents and sails to feed himself. Living in caves or exposed to the elements, enduring beatings, whippings, and even stonings from the people that he preached to. Now that's quite a status drop, isn't it? Any way that you measure it, that is a status drop. But I want to clarify a word that Paul uses in Philippians 3.8. And I'm just going to put that up on the screen for you. This is what he says. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now the NIV translation uses that word garbage. Now, if our blender stops working, at least in our house, we tend to consider it garbage and we throw it away. But to some people who are mechanically inclined, a few tweaks here and there, and they have a perfectly good working blender. One person's junk is another person's treasure. But Paul uses a Greek word here, 
A, no, a noun, plural, accusative. That means dung, excrement, or rotted food that is thrown away when he uses the word garbage. Now we think of garbage as involving something of value that no longer works or is no good. But the term that Paul uses shows that the things that he spent his life chasing after, the things that he once thought were so important, were of lower value than raw sewage. That's a graphic image that Paul intentionally chose to use. One that his readers in Philippi understood immediately. But we have softened our modern translations so as not to offend delicate sensibilities. So when you read the word garbage, you should have an image of raw sewage. Paul is not rejecting his belief or heritage as an Orthodox Jew. The rest of Paul's letters and the story of his ministry in the book of Acts clearly show how much he valued being a Jew. But he understood that following Jesus made him a completed Jew, not a lesser one. His standards weren't lowered, they were raised. God took what was good in Paul's life and he made it better. And he does the same with all of us. You know, I'm reminded of the words of missionary Jim Elliot, who said, He is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. So in other words, we are to make Jesus the cornerstone of our lives. You know, one example in recent history of someone who undeniably made Jesus the cornerstone of her life is Mother Teresa. In his book, What Would Jesus Say?, Lee Strobel describes what Jesus might say to ten key figures of our society, one of whom is Mother Teresa. And I want to just contrast her life briefly with Paul's. Mother Teresa was an 18-year-old Yugoslavian girl named Agnes when she actually left home to become a nun. And over the next 20 years, she taught middle-class high school students and was often referred to, her, referred to by her colleagues as being average. Can you imagine Mother Teresa being called average? But then she felt God calling her in 1946 to serve India's poor. She started with nothing, no shelter or finances. She picked up a woman dying in the gutter who had been partially eaten by rats and ants and brought her to a hospital badgering the reluctant doctors until they finally treated the woman. And since then, hundreds of thousands have been rescued and facilities have been opened for orphans, lepers, and AIDS patients. It's just incredible the impact that she had. And she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1977 and since then has become a household name and the living image of what Christian servanthood is supposed to look like. Mother Teresa was not a rising star in the church. She had no inclination toward power or position in the Vatican. Unlike Paul, she was just a humble, average nun whom God chose to have a miraculous impact on the world through. She was humble even in death. Now many people don't even recall when she died. And since there wasn't a whole lot of media coverage surrounding it. You'd think the death of someone like Mother Teresa would generate countless television specials about her life. However, God called Mother Teresa home on a very abnormal news day. She died September 5, 1997, and her death wasn't actually reported until the following day, September 6, the day of Princess Diana's funeral. Television, radio, magazines, newspapers saturated continuous coverage about Diana Spencer's life with hardly a word about Mother Teresa. Even in death, she was able to avoid the spotlight. You know, often people think to be devoted to Jesus Christ, we need to be like Mother Teresa. We need to sell all of our stuff and we need to move to India. But Jesus doesn't want more Mother Teresa's. He's already had one. 
But he does want each one of us to serve in the roles that he has provided for us as his followers. You know, when Mother Teresa was once asked how others should serve, whether they should fly to India to join her, this is what she said. I know you think you should make a trip to Calcutta, but I strongly advise you to save your airfare and spend it on the poor in your own country. It's easy to love people far away, but it's not easy to love those who live right next to us. There are thousands of people dying for a piece of bread, but there are thousands more dying for a bit of love or a bit of acknowledgement. The truth is, the worst disease today is not leprosy or tuberculosis. It's being unwanted. It's being left out. It's being forgotten. The greatest scourge is to be so suffocated with things that we forget the next person. We're not all called to be missionaries overseas. But we are called to be missionaries wherever we are. You know, lots of people do good things for the poor, and Christians don't have a monopoly on that area. But there was something so special about Mother Teresa that made her more than just a social worker who prays. Lee Strobel points out that there are some characteristics that should distinguish Christ's servants from others. Sort of a checklist that we can use as followers of Jesus to see if those qualities are are true for us also. And the first is this. Be a distributor, not a manufacturer. Be a distributor, not a manufacturer. You know, some people manufacture compassion for the needy from their own needs or motivation. Maybe they feel guilty about being wealthy, or they just feel pity for the poor, or they feel they need to give something back to society or they have this psychological need to put others before themselves in order to feel better about themselves. But whatever the source is, eventually that runs out. We need to be distributors, connecting with Jesus in prayer each morning, filling our lives with his word, his love and guidance from the Bible, and then spending the rest of our day as conduits which God's love can be poured out to other people. Secondly, we need to serve God, not ourselves. You know, sometimes we let volunteering become self-promotion, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two. You know, one writer described it this way about volunteering. There's so much to gain personally from volunteering. You feel good, you see and you learn things that you would not otherwise have. You test your abilities. You often find yourselves rubbing shoulders with pillars in your community who help you in your business or career. Volunteering, he says, can be another pathway to upward mobility. But that's garbage. That's pure ego. That's not servanthood. That's following me not following Jesus. Serving others should bring us closer to God. Third, respect the people that you serve. Don't pity them. Respect the people that you serve. Don't pity them. You know, if we pity people that we serve, that attitude, it seeps through to our actions and the person in need feels devalued. Each person is created in God's image, and each person has value to God. They're not case numbers or patients to God. They are worthy of all of our respect and dignity, because we expect that ourselves. The fourth characteristic is a willingness to sacrifice, not just a willingness to serve, a willingness that we should sacrifice things and not just serve. And there's a difference. You know, when service to others begins to interfere with our life events, what do we do? We tend to reduce our service. But Jesus sets a much higher standard for us as his disciples. Because service to others is inconvenient. True servanthood requires sacrifice. 
Jesus commanded us to love each other as he has loved us. The fifth characteristic is a willingness to follow God's agenda instead of our own. You know, it's an amazing source of comfort and strength when we are doing, when we are sure we are doing what God has called us to do. It's, it's amazing. It's so affirming. It's incredible when you know you are doing what God has asked you to do. The sixth characteristic is that we each have spiritual gifts, not just abilities. And we tap into those the moment that we give our lives to Jesus Christ when we make him our cornerstone. Each of us are hardwired by God with different spiritual gifts. And I would encourage you, if you haven't done so already, take a spiritual gifts assessment. You know, some have spiritual gifts of mercy or compassion or teaching or pastoring or evangelism or any of about two dozen other spiritual gifts. Often people have multiple spiritual gifts that overlap and reinforce their natural God-given strengths in those areas. God gives gifts not for us, but he gives us gifts so that we can share them with other people. Next, we need to rely on God, not organizations. We need to rely on our Lord and not organizations. You know, there's a story about Mother Teresa telling her superiors that she had five pennies and a dream of God to build an orphanage. To which her superiors responded that there was no way she could build an orphanage or do anything for that matter for five pennies. And she replied, I know, but with God and five pennies, I could do anything. You know, organizations like the Orphan Grain Train or the Norfolk Rescue Mission. They do wonderful, wonderful things for people. And we should support them. And we'll continue to support them. But we also need to rely on Jesus, not just organizations. Because quite often, Jesus does what our organizations can't do. Finally, we need to keep an eye on eternity, not just looking to the needs of today. We need to keep an eye on eternity, the big picture, not just the needs of today. You know, Mother Teresa's approach to preaching salvation of Jesus was, and this is how she put it, to preach Christ without preaching, not by words, but by putting his love and our love into action. She lived out Jesus' command in the Gospel of Matthew to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Friends, by doing these things, we keep Jesus as the cornerstone of our life. But when we make ourselves the cornerstone, even our good deeds for others end up being tainted and the recipients of our efforts don't see Jesus in us. But when we make Jesus the center of our lives, the cornerstone, the foundation, people will see him in everything that we do. Just as everyone who looks at a building sees the cornerstone. So I ask you this morning, unequivocally, is Jesus the cornerstone of your life? Because if he is, everything else is garbage. Let's pray.